I'd like, like to call to order the uh, meeting of the Rutland City Board of School Commissioners and all that would like to rise and join in the Pledge of Allegiance. that all commissioners are in attendance with the exception of Fagan, Dungies, and Studley. Um, so I would entertain a motion for an approval of the agenda and at our desks we have an addendum to the personnel memo. So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Motion carries. So first up is our consent agenda with the meeting minutes, uh, personnel memo 639 and addendum, and then we have two bids for computer laptops and HVAC equipment replacement. In a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. And, and all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. And then next up for public comment, we had one person, Jen, sorry, I meant to write down your last name, Jen, I apologize. Okay, it's Ron Danoni. Okay, welcome. Do I sit here? Yes. Um, yes, you can sit, stand however you're comfortable. Um, okay, I can just stand, I have it prepared. Um, good evening, I'm here to address the board about an incident at RIS last month. I've attempted to work directly with the school system to resolve the matter, but there's been no appreciable action. Last month, my daughter had a guest teacher. There was a circle discussion, what would you change if you were president? One of the students said, end abortion. Instead of saying okay and moving on, the guest teacher started a discussion and expressed her own views on abortion. And in my daughter's words, tried to get us all to be pro-life. My daughter told me she made a face, which drew the guest teacher's attention. The guest teacher then focused on my daughter, demanding she declare her abortion stance. My daughter is 11. She didn't want to answer and said so. The teacher pressed until she finally said she thought it should be the woman's choice, to which the guest teacher responded, so you think babies like my unborn granddaughter should be killed. I contacted the school. We had a phone conference January 24th. Following this, my daughter was given a safety talk and told it would have been beneficial if she had told someone there immediately. She came home upset, feeling she had done something wrong because she told me first. I emailed Carrie again, CCing Bill Olson and Rob Bliss. Rob contacted me and we met January 31st. I left believing action would be taken to protect my daughter. Less than a week later, the guest teacher was at RIS again. I've been respectful and kind, but my requests and suggestions have fallen on deaf ears. Yesterday, I emailed the board a list of the specific actions I've suggested. I was told my daughter would receive a written apology from the teacher. It was delivered after I put myself on the list to speak tonight. I was told, uh, excuse me, ostensibly, the only one suffering any consequences in this matter is my daughter. I went through the entire guest teacher hiring packet and not once in there is there a mention about maintaining boundaries regarding personal or political beliefs. I'm asking the school board to uphold its mission statement, citing you will provide a safe and healthy environment that offers mutual respect. I'm asking the school board to uphold its mission statement, citing you will address the social and environmental needs of all students. I'm asking the board to address this situation and implement changes to prevent other students from being bullied and traumatized. I'm also asking that RCPS adopt a bill of rights for students and parents so they may have an avenue to address any issues that may arrive in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. for coming before us. No one else signed up for public comment. So next up, we have the school program updates and the student representatives report. So I'll turn it over. On February 10th, RIS held a school-wide PBIS celebration. Our entire student body and staff either cheered on friends or played Hungry Hungry Hippos in the Keith Gym. It was an exciting celebration filled with music and laughter. Students were rewarded for their collective efforts in filling our school-wide token jar. As we work towards filling the jar again, the memories made at this event will be long-lasting. We also celebrated the 100th day of school on February 10th. We saw some of our staff and students transform into what they would expect to look like when they turned 100. We hope they, we can all look that good. 
Northwest had a bunch of celebrating for the 100th day of school on Friday, and then again today for Valentine's Day. Students were able to do so, many educational engaging activities around these two special days. Northwest was able to honor the foster grandparents at the monthly hero assembly. The foster grandparent program is a very special is very special and Northwest is very lucky lucky to have these volunteers. Julie Austin, Tom Eno, Mary Fusco, and Carol Merrill. There is a parent teacher meeting this week on Thursday, February sixteenth. These meetings are held virtually. The meeting begins at six PM. Northeast second grade students celebrated Rutland by visiting downtown establishments and decorating windows with hearts and messages of appreciation. Classrooms celebrated 100 day of school doing many math and art projects involving hundreds of steps and ingredients. Northeast looks forward to a family's contra dance to be held Thursday, February 16th in the Northeast School Gym. Uh, at Rutland High School, over 158 students, as part of their social studies classes, attended a school day presentation at the Paramount Theater to meet with author, author Andrew Aiden, who co-wrote the book March, along with civil rights icon Senator John Lewis. The book is a retelling of the civil rights movement, specifically focusing on John Lewis's role. Students had the opportunity to speak with and ask questions of the author and also get an autographed copy of the book. Rutland Middle School is finishing their last week of lifelong sports. It has been incredibly successful. We have watched relationships between students and staff flourish. We have watched students gain confidence and a sense of belonging as they learn a new sport. As always, we are thankful for the local partnerships we have created with the businesses hosting our students. Our eighth grade English and social studies classes are working on their mock legislature unit. Students are learning about government and bills. Each student is looking at bills that they are interested in being explored in current legislative session. Each will choose one that interests them to research and will be debating these bills in both small groups and as an entire class. As an enrichment to this project, we will send 15 RMS students to the YMCA Vermont Models Youth Legislator in April. 18 students attended a student-led Getting to Y conference where they analyzed Rutland Middle School's youth risk behavior survey data and created an action plan to address concerning data points. The students showed respect and maturity in discussing difficult topics. Tonight, Stafford Technical Center is hosting a mixer for the Chamber and Economic Development of the Rutland Region. We are excited to share the opportunities available at Stafford for both high school and adult mm -hmm. students with our community partners. Our culinary arts program will be preparing appetizers and tours will be offered of our center throughout the evening. Current sophomores and juniors that have applied to Stafford for next school year have completed their visits to their programs of choice. We have had 395 visits over a two week period from 12 different high schools, including homeschool students. The admissions team has now begun the process of reviewing the almost 400 student applications that have been submitted. Acceptance letters for current sophomores and juniors will be sent out in early March. We will then look at where we have openings and invite current freshmen that have applied for visits. Great, thank you, Lauren and Holden. All right, next up on the agenda is the activities and athletic reports. And Mike Norman here to present to us on that. Good evening. Hi, my name is Mike Norman. I'm the Athletic and Activities Director, and uh, I believe in your packet there's the eight-page document that was sent to you, and if you just want to, I'm just going to go over it, and you can please stop me anytime with any questions or concerns. Uh, the first page talks about the Athletic and Activities Council. What has happened is there was an Athletic Council, and then there was an Activities Council, and then what we have done, we've consolidated both, so now people that are athletically oriented and then people who are club oriented, you know, so everybody's together in a co-curricular format has been very beneficial. You know, there's parents, there's advisors, there's coaches, teachers, a school board uh, representative, student rep representatives as well. And that's a place that people can go to to, you know, bring concerns about athletic and activities if things need to be changed or they'd like to find out why things are being done in a particular way. We typically meet on Tuesdays, our next meeting 
Kevin is going to be on a Monday night, so you'll be able to go. Great. Um, and we typically meet anywhere from four to six times a year. And uh, we do things like review the handbook for athletic and activities and things that come up uh, of concern of people. Uh, the second page is a breakdown of the athletic teams or sports. It starts with alpine skiing and goes all the way down to track. And track is uh, spring track. It's indoor track, which is during the winter. And there's a comparison there of the numbers from 21, 22, and 2021. Uh, the numbers are, are coming back. And I can honestly tell you that the numbers this year for this current school year are going to be higher than the numbers from last year. I mean, somebody asked me why I think just to be my gut feeling is is that kids are still having a hard time getting re-engaged with what we're trying to do. But I think uh, more and more kids are uh, getting involved. And as I've said to and I've been there a long time now, there was a time where you just showed up and there'd be 50, 60 kids for you to coach, and that would kind of be it. Now as a coach, you have to really advocate for your program and you're going to have to, you know, kids are going to have to be asked to participate. And, uh, you know, again, I think you have to be more of a transformative leader than a transactional leader. And uh, I think things are, are on the upswing. We still have too many kids that aren't doing anything. And as the presentation goes on, you can take a look at the numbers. And then down below is the middle school. And, uh, we don't offer football. We don't offer ice hockey at the middle school level and again you can look at the numbers there as well the next page is a breakdown of uh, I mean teams football soccer through the fall uh, winter sports and uh, and uh, spring sports and this is from last year and again you know I think our numbers are are relatively strong and as I was talking to Bill earlier uh, tonight when I came in here, I was at a JVB basketball game earlier tonight, and one of our students that just came to the high school from the Ukraine, literally a year ago, he left the Ukraine, and he's here in Vermont, and uh, he just kind of dropped in, and he just started playing basketball uh, late. He's on our JVB basketball team, so I think it's a powerful thing for allowing him to kind of get used to how things are done here in the United States, and he seems to be having a good experience uh, with that. It's a breakdown of teams, high school, middle school, coaches. Some of the coaches, there's is an asterisk in the margin. Some sports, what they'll do, and we, we have done this, and I'm the football coach as well, we will take a one position and cut it in half. So we'll get two coaches for the price of one. Sometimes we'll actually take one position and cut it into thirds um, just to get people involved. And that does not take into account how many volunteers that we have. I would imagine that fall, winter, and spring, we probably have anywhere from 20 to 25 folks that are volunteer coaches. And most of them are there every single day, all certainly all during the season and going to camps and doing those sites of things. They have to have the same certifications, you know, first aid, CPR, uh, coaching, uh, sports medicine, things of that nature, concussion training. But I think our numbers, relatively speaking, compared to a lot of schools is, particularly in this area, it's stronger. We have more kids participating. We are a little bit bigger school, but compared to the other Division I schools, and most of them are in the Chittenden County area, you know, for instance, like basketball, most teams do not have a third level basketball team for boys or girls, and we have both. And like tonight, the last JVB boys game, and, and JVB <laughs> was freshman. Uh, or J.V. White, when we had J.V. White and Red, things have changed over time. Uh, typically, they're playing some third-level teams from other schools, but a lot of their games against J.V. teams, like tonight they're playing Otter Valley because whoever Otter Valley's team was playing tonight did not have a J.V. level, so we were able to get them uh, a game. And like during the winter, you're allowed to participate, you know, have 20 games. We, we weren't quite there because we had a couple of games that, that canceled along the way. The next page, page four, is about all our clubs and activities there. <clears throat> and again, much like the athletic piece, I think we're coming back. Um, you know, there's a couple of different we changed. Blake Mechtel is, is, is a lot of the, the vocal stuff at the high school, and 
we had Maelstroms and, and another group, and we changed it to Amped Up and Vibrato for a lot of different reasons. But again, I think these people, you know, much the same, are, are doing a lot and trying to get as many kids involved as they can. You know, I mean, right now, if you look at most of the numbers in our, on our teams or our clubs, I would say the, the smallest grouping is the junior class. And that is the class that came to the high school when we were right in the, the thick of things with, with COVID. And I think they're still learning how to deal with things. And I think athletics and certainly activities is a way to, to do that as well. But I think our numbers are, are, are relatively strong. It, they certainly could be better for sure, and we're working on it. The next page is the numbers down at uh, the middle school and at RIS. And much can be said uh, about that as well. It's pretty consistent. I think we do offer a lot of clubs and activities, and we do have a process. If uh, a student would like to start a club, there's a process for them to go through. You know, you're going to have to write a proposal. You're going to have to get an advisor to, to do it. Most of our advisors are in-house. Some of them are, are non-school employees, not, not very many, because a lot of this stuff is done right after school. And, uh, you know, it kind of goes up, up and down. The next page, page six, really gets to, you know, as far as the, the high school is concerned, it, it really talks about, like, activities. I mean, you know, activity participation, one, that means that Jane Smith is in one club, and then there's, you know, I mean, there's 110 folks like that. But there's also one student that was in, or seven students, rather, uh, three students that were in seven activities. I don't know how they do it because they're probably taking AP courses and playing three sports and in the band, but it's uh, pretty amazing what uh, young people can do. And then athletically, it talks about, you know, being a one sport, a two sport, or a three sport athlete. Our goal is to have kids to be multi sport athletes, meaning to don't lock in on one. You know, I mean, if, if football is your favorite, go play basketball or go play ice hockey, go play lacrosse or do those sorts of things because it's my experience and my belief that being a multi-sport athlete is going to make you more recruitable to a college if that's what you want to do. Or if you're going to go the route of like junior hockey or things like that, you only get to do high school one time and you're probably not going to go to college till you're going to be 20 or 21 years old. And uh, again, I think when you're 13, 14, it's really difficult to figure out what your best sport is going to be. And most of the kids at the high school that have used athletics as a means to get to the next level have been multi-sport athletes. And I think we have the good fortune to be able to have a lot of offerings, and we have a lot of kids that do that. And, you know, we had, and then at the end of the year, we have, uh, you know, AAA award. And what that is is a person that has 120 hours of community service. You can get 40 hours per sport and you're only allowed two so you can get 80 hours like if you play soccer and, and uh, you're on the ski team you have to do 40 hours in our clubs keep track of that and a lot of kids you mean go way over there um, and then you get a certificate at the end of the year and if you do that for all four years then you get a nice plaque and uh, again it, it's something that you know it's a carrot for the kids to chase and then we do the same thing uh, tri scholar athlete with athletics is to be on the honor roll as well. Uh, same thing with the AAA award uh, and play three sports. And to me, that's kind of what it's all about, being a, a well-rounded student athlete and, and just, you know, again, using one thing for the other. And I think our kids are very well prepared uh, there. And I think, you know, both sports and activities are helping them just become a better version of themselves. And our participation, uh, was you know 49.50 and again when I first went to the high school in 94 95 that's a long time now we had about 750 kids and we, we had a little bit more uh, you know it was probably like 53 percent or 54 percent but again I think if this was in comparison to other schools I think we would be I don't know if we'd be at the top but we'd be pretty close and I think that's an important thing um, the Academic Achievement Award, which I alluded to, you know, Tri Scholar Athlete. I mean, last year we had 10. Okay, so 10, 10 kids, you know, got a nice plaque, and they were recognized at uh, senior awards. 
and 42 underclassmen were, were there. Okay, so you know, again, I, I just think you have to find something that's going to for kids to chase and to lock lock into to kind of pull them through the process. I mean, being a parent and having had two kids, one was sports and the other one was activities and community service. So just finding something there to do it. The AAA award, there were four seniors and there two one underclassmen. I think sometimes, I mean, we, sh we need to do a better job with AAA, but I mean, uh, last Friday night I went to the College of St. Joe's and the uh, Night of the Shining Star was were there and that was run by Tim Tebow Foundation and the Key Club and a lot of other kids from the high school were there with all kinds of special needs folks uh, that, were, that were currently at the high school and then I went with my wife and I was having one of those days, which hopefully you never have, and I walked in there and I saw a couple of my friends from 25 years ago and it was just kind of cool. Now they're, you know, 30 something years old and, you know, they have boyfriends and girlfriends. It's kind of cool to, to be a part of that and they still remember what the high school provided for them. So I think it's good stuff. And then the last page talks about our athletic training services. I think a lot of people don't know any better and take it for granted, and sometimes I'm one of those people. But Tyler White is our athletic trainer, and we contract him out through VOC, and he runs iSport up on the mountain. And he's there every day. He talks about the sports. Ideally, we would have a trainer at every sport, at every practice, all the time. But to be totally honest with you, um, I don't, you know, we, there's just not enough qualified people out there, number one, just like a lot of other things and then the financial ramifications of it. But I can say this as, as a coach, you know, we had one of our best players get really hurt in the last game of the year over at Hartford Lake, had to be taken to the hospital and everything. <coughs> our trainer was on the sidelines. The kid didn't even hit the ground, and he was running out on the field because he saw what happened like everybody else, and he provided care along with the EMTs and whatnot from Hartford and they brought him to the hospital and had to do what he had to do. The other thing being is that, you know, Matt Gammons, the doctor, the, he's a sports med doctor, he took it upon himself without even speaking to any of us. He called the parents uh, the following morning and he saw the student athlete that day. So we're really, really fortunate that we can get out in front of this stuff. And I think our kids are, are getting, uh, you know, really taken care of in, in the right way. And, uh, I think it's it's just a it's a real positive thing for everybody. Well, it's a lot in a short period of time. Does anybody have any questions? I actually do. Sure. Um, I will say first off, I think sports are wonderful. Children need to have something else other than academics to keep them going and something to challenge them. Um, that being said, I would like to know if you might be able to come up with some information for us board members because I'm really kind of curious about the process for how you select people for the coaching and whatnot, and it would just be nice to have some clarification of that. Okay. Well, we have a, we have a coach's handbook. Okay. That, that's all clearly defined that we, we go through. Okay. Would you want to know how it's done right uh, now, I, or I, do you want to see No, I don't need to know on the spot, but if you could just email the board, I think it would be n nice information for us to have okay. as to what the process is as sure. far as... Yep. you know, how you go about that. Yep, no problem. Um, when is your next meeting of the Athletic Activities Council? Do you have a date or? It's gonna be March 1st. And that's at the high school? That's at the high school. It's in room red 11. Charlie? Just to make sure I heard you correctly, the participation level, like you said, compared to other schools, the 50% range, is is a good percentage I, I I have no idea what other students are participating in sports in other schools so we're at a, a good level for that being the old guy and all this stuff now and, and going to national meetings and everything it is a problem from coast to coast about kids getting re-engaged whether it be sports or clubs or anything um, fine arts and our number it's been higher in the past but our, our number is pretty strong. Everything is relative. Many of, I don't know many of you, but I am a very competitive person, and I am of the strongest. <coughs> Courtney knows. Um, I co I'm so old I coach Courtney. Um, I, I wish every kid would be on at least one sports team and be a part of one club because I think 
somebody said earlier, it's about being well-rounded and I think you've got to learn how to be a good teammate and learn how to be coachable and, and take constructive criticism and do things maybe that you don't want to do but you're going to do in the best interest of the group. You know, I mean, what this is about, you know, I mean, somebody said to me back a few weeks ago, and again, I'm always learning, all roads lead to adult league. You know, so <laughs> it doesn't matter. We've had some kids that have played professionally, but they're all out of sports and they're doing their thing. But I think it's just making them a better version of them, whether they end up going to college or what have you. There, and we talk all the time to our coaches is to make sure you know kids want to continue to play and be a part of things. Certainly, playing time, social media, and all that good stuff has just made it a, a lot more interesting. I'll, I'll say. Well, if, if I could add to that, I, I think Charlene, to your point, the you know when you see these numbers, they they only sort of gain meaning in context. Like so, how how is this number compared to blank? And I think sometimes it makes sense to compare to other schools. <coughs> Our past practice, I think, has been you know because it is it is challenging to compare to say like a neighboring school or because. Maybe they don't have as many offerings, or you know, whatever the case might be. Our past practice has been: we want to we want to do better this year than we did last year, and we want to sort of continue to grow. For sure, COVID really threw things for a loop. Like I think just the level of engagement <coughs> became more difficult. You know, like social distancing by by its definition meant that there were activities that were no longer happening anymore. So. So our work has really been about like, how are we doing now compared to how we did last year? How do we continue to grow that number? Um, how do we make sure that activities are relevant to students that are in our school today com that might not have been, but that might, you know, might no longer be relevant? Um, you know, how do, we, how do we continue to keep that uh, process attractive to students? So. We're at the sort of beginning point of that resetting, but that's our sort of level of comparison: is what's the number that we had last year? How do how do we comp how do we then make it? Uh, how do we sort of give this year's numbers meaning compared to last year? From the limited information that I know, then I know there are some students that are picking up sports that they had done maybe a couple of years ago, and then they dropped off for a year, and now they're starting. I think it's nice that you're letting them come back in, even though they may not be at that level, like yeah. three, four yeah. years ago, at least they can still participate and pick up the stick again and get back in when, you know, they were doing it kind of before. Since I've been here, I think one of the strengths of the school system is, and both my kids went through the system, K to 12, but the high school is that the opportunities that kids have, and even opportunities that they don't even know about are there to be created. And this afternoon, I was literally talking to a talking to a couple of kids to play, and I pointed at a kid. I said he should play football, and he said, "Yeah, he, we're trying to get him back to play." And I think um, young people today are aware of all this, and they're very welcoming. Um, it's probably a little different than when I was growing up, where if you you had to pick sides, it's not it's not like that. Our kids have done a really good job with that. Yeah, um, I just I wanted to spin off of what you just said. Actually, um, I have a, I had a very athletic older child and we got to know Tyler Tyler White very well and he was great because <laughs> my kid got a lot of concussions um, but um, <coughs> my second kid is a senior this year and they're the least athletic child and um, when they were a freshman before COVID I could I literally opened the book and said pick something and because there was so much for them to pick from and they tried golf and they tried tennis which they were actually really good at tennis but they're not athletic so and then um, they've had a really hard time coming back from COVID. They're really struggling. And um, there's still stuff at the school for them to do. They're in the music program now and they love the music program. Blake Mechtel is doing an amazing job with those kids in that music program. And um, it's the only thing that gets them out of bed and gets them to school is that program. So I just, I've been really encouraged to how much is there for both of my kids. They're so different in their interests, but the school has always had a place for both of them to find a pl way to go so I've just I hope it I hope it continues and I'm really I'm really behind all these programs so I have one more um, I, I also want to just give a shout out to the tapestry and epic programs Marie and and her work were 
you know, uh, I, in the announcements today, I'm not sure I'm going to remember them all, but through that program, we have a club that's meeting once a week, uh, introduction to rugby, sculpture and ceramics. There's a volleyball group that's been meeting pretty regularly now for a few months, and I know I'm skipping two more, but that has really served as a great sort of low-level, entry-level club or activity. You know, it's above a pickup game, but it's below a varsity sport where students are like, yes, I can, I can go twice this week, but I'm, I'm kind of busy next week. So that has been another area that's, that's really not even included in these numbers. Um, but uh, the EPIC and, and uh, Tapestry program has really been effective in that regard, too. I just wanted to congratulate the girls' hockey team who oh, yeah. had their first <laughs> big win easy. yesterday or last evening. And I think that um, supports your point that I know um, last year the girls didn't even believe they were going to be able to have a hockey team because there, so many kids had graduated and they couldn't get kids. And they went out, and I think the girls who are upperclassmen have been amazing with the younger ones who've had no experience and are coming in and they are acting as a team and I think it shows through their win last night. I think if you go watch them play, you can drink a cup of coffee or whatever, you, you know, have a hot chocolate and just kind of smile and enjoy the whole thing because everything is in the proper perspective. And last night when they won, you know, shout out to their coaching staff mm -hmm. because six months ago we didn't have a team. We were trying to decide, I mean, are we going to go try to go member to member, which is a whole different other avenue to go and send them to Hartford or Middlebury or Burn Burton or Woodstock or what have you and it was the kids Karen that just really went out and beat the bushes to get kids and I went the very first day and like I said I was at hockey the very first time we had girls hockey at the high school down at the Royce Mandigo and the difference from that day to last night was was huge and credit goes to some of the kids that have been around because they've sacrificed some of their own personal successes for the for the betterment of the program and a year from now two years from now I think you know I mean it, it'll be kind of a moot point and we'll just look back like on a lot of the kids that played uh, played seven on seven in football it wasn't so much about playing football it's about keeping the game alive and providing opportunities for kids down the road who you don't even know and I think that says a lot to them uh, coach Norman thanks for all that you're doing I think it's amazing what what you have there. Um, I'm lucky enough to have Sierra in early college with me over at Castleton. <laughs> I have her in my introduction to sport management class, so it's been really nice to get to know her and all the shots that she has faced this season. <laughs> practice. Yeah, she's had a lot of practice. So um, anyway, uh, I have a vested interest in this, but you've got a really great group of girls hockey players coming behind them just a few years away. Mm -hmm. So let's try to keep that uh, team going <laughs> for sure, because it's a pretty tight knit group in the so four, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade right now. Mm -hmm. So let's hang on for a few more years if we can with those, with those girls. But anyway, I have actual questions, which um, uh, what is the criteria for the Academic Achievement Award? What is that? Yeah, you, have to, you have to be on the honor roll all year long and year end studies and then do a t 120 hours of community service. Oh, okay. I, I did a poor job of explaining it. But like if you, sure. if you were to play girls hockey, you get 40 hours there, and then you have to get 80 more. If you played a second sport, you'd get another 40 hours, and then right. all the advisors keep a track of how often they meet and for how long. And then those numbers are turned in at the end of the year, and that's how we tabulate all that stuff. All right. What is honor roll at the high school? Uh, I would, I would okay. want to look it up. That's fine. Okay, that's fine, yeah. Okay. That used um. to be an easy question. <laughs> well, I know, right? Yeah, Sorry. I I realized after I asked it that it would not be an easy question to answer. So, um, uh, and lastly, like, is there a method to start a new club? Like, how, like if a kid came to you and said, "Hey, I want to," I got five people. You know, is there is there a method that's advertised that you guys do? Or I had somebody come to me within the last <coughs> six months and say they'll come knocking on the door and they kind of poke their head in like I'm the big bad wolf. <laughs> and I'm like, hi, how are you? Can I help you? And they usually come in pairs or a pack. <laughs> you want to start a Pokemon club. <laughs> okay. What do we need to do? And there's, okay, you need to get a list of students that want to participate, get an advisor, okay, and tell that and, have, and, and write a proposal. And then when all that comes through, we can sit down and talk about it because you know the, the process is is that you have to run the club 
two or three years, give or take, and you know, be able to you know substantiate the numbers, and then it's my job to go to you all, or go to Bill, or go to Greg, and talk about it and say, okay, we would like to you know get a stipend to to provide for somebody, and and that that's happened. You know? And then some clubs were really popular, and then they've gone out of popularity due to maybe the advisor has changed, or maybe there was a strong group of kids that had, were pursuing it, and then it kind of goes away, and then these the, the students will come back and say, hey, we want to, you know, we don't have this club, would you ever like to start it? And again, having a little bit of institutional knowledge, I said, oh yeah, we had that in 1999, and they look at me like, where's <laughs> forever going? We just, you know, go there. I, like I said, not because I worked there, but because, or the school system rather, it's just I really believe if if you wanna wanna do it, you can do it. It might take a little bit of work, put a little bit of sweat equity in, and a lot of kids have done a lot of nice things. You had any interest in esports? Not that I'm a fan of replacing activity with motion with video games, but I know it's it's just such a such well, a. Well, it's it's here. here yeah. You know, yeah. There's there's three sports right now that we currently don't have. Volleyball is a VPA sanctioned sport that's predominantly. Chittenden County, Essex, Seaview, those guys. Not everybody is doing it. Uh, 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 bass fishing is another one. Uh, bowling is another one. And now esports. And that, that's, that, it's here. There are schools that are having it. And again, <coughs> that, that's a conversation simply if if your daughter was coming to the high school and said, hey, I want to do esports," and I'd say I'd have that conversation and we'd go from there. And then it would be my responsibility to come to you all to get the funding I mean, you know, to do that. You know, we have a nice, all the, bowl, all the bowling matches are done right here. Right here. But, you know what I mean, when you start running it, you know, the, the, the reality is this is that, okay, we want to have a bowling team. And I'm not saying this has happened. But okay, so now you have to sign training rules, you have to go to the sports meetings, you have to do everything else there. And you know, many, many years ago, uh, you know, we started girls lacrosse before boys lacrosse. I was not the athletic director. It's because the boys were playing club through the rec and they didn't want to have to go through what we require. So the girls wanted to do it and that's how we ended up getting girls lacrosse first. Thank you. Can I just say, I was wondering if they, if our two senior reps had any perspective on this, these topics. Well, personally, I'm a three-sport athlete. I play field hockey, I ski race, and I play lacrosse. And it's just really an amazing program and, like, what all of our teachers and faculty and our coaches give to us. I think it's, like, a really cool thing that everyone should be involved in because it's really changed my perspective on high school. And I'm able to meet, like, through my field hockey program, I'm able to like meet freshmen I never would have before because you're able to play sports with them. So I just think it's a really cool opportunity everyone should take part in. And I do the music program. I'm in band and jazz band, and that's also been really enjoyable since I've been at the high school. And I think Mr. Barnett does a really good job with teaching all of us and continuing our musical journey, making sure that we stay interested in the music program, which is important. On a side note, Lauren was recognized as one of the top scholar athletes this year in the fall. Uh, she was the third of the three Salomano kids that did it, so that's, I don't think that's trouble. ever been done. But again, I think it speaks to what both of you guys are saying. You can find your people, so to speak, there. And if you go there, and regardless of what sending school you're from, you can try new things and do different things. And if you don't like it, change and go do go do something else and if there's something that's not offered for you then there's a there's a, a mechanism you know for you to get involved uh, somehow it's not perfect okay we've got a lot of work to do certainly but i think you know our staff has done a really nice job certainly the kids have and i just had um a question i was wondering what we have either implemented or have in place um i'm sure everyone has seen crazy news stories going on in our backyard oh. Um, so certainly to combat, you know, unsportsmanlike behavior, racism within our teams and within our fans, 
um, and to keep everyone safe, make sure the coaches are supported and the officials are supportive and, and what we've kind of doing in that avenue. Well, our athletic council met today. We have a student leadership <coughs> council. And, uh, we, some of the, you know, and again, kids are busy, so we probably had 50% of the kids were there. But uh, something that we talk about, I'm a member of the DEI committee for the state of Vermont and the VSADA, and I'm on the non-binary committee. And uh, just trying to stay in front of the change that's going on so everybody is well informed. Mm -hmm. uh, we have security. Our coaches are all certified and what have you. Um, but w what's gone on in large part, it's, you know, not to get into politics, but it's a lot of stuff that you turn on the television and read the paper. But I think the people, we go to the basketball game after this, and somebody said, because we had an incident in an away game the other day, and one of the coaches said, that would never happen. That would never happen. Right. And again, it's, it's because of the support, when, you know, it's the support from Bill, the assistants, Greg, his, his crew there, our coaches, the kids. And you know, our kids have done a really good job of learning how to behave and cheer appropriately. But the world in which we live, you can just say things and then you can't roll them back. And the thing that's really added fuel to the fire is uh, social media. You know what I mean? And, and again, we have those situations taking place. But uh, our kids are pretty serious about it. Our school, you know, we don't see a lot of bullying and hazing and harassment going on. Um, we have security at the games. You know, a challenge is, is uh, the spectators. A challenge is the fans. And, and again, to the ever-present problem around the country, it's hard finding coaches and it's hard finding officials because of the lack of the abuse that they take. I mean, again, I grew up playing ice hockey. Ice hockey officials at one time in high school had their name on the back of the jersey. Now they don't do that because they're just getting, I mean, ridiculed. I mean, we had a coach the other day at a game that uh, somebody from another team was talking trash about the jacket that he had on. And his 15-year-old other daughter is sitting in the bleachers having to listen to this next to her mother. I mean, that's a tough spot. You mean to be in, and uh, but I think our people have taken the high road, uh, and I think we've really, you know, worked hard on that. But again, it it doesn't work if we don't get the support from right. the administration, from you guys. Well, you know? and I would I would add to. I mean, I think that the I think it's a really good question, and I think this is one of those cases where every school has rules on the books. The question is not the rules on the books. The question is the implementation with three minutes left in the third quarter of a JV basketball game. Um, and I, I give a lot of credit to uh, our athletic director. There is a pervasive sense of we address behavior. Um, and there, when we see it, we address it. Um, and I think that trickles out through the school. And I do, you know, I have seen firsthand. Uh, I've had occasion to address it sometimes myself, but but I think it is largely a cultural kind of a kind of a thing that pervades events and teams. Um, when there have been issues and transgressions, and there have been issues and transgressions, they're addressed. And, and you know, we had one. Uh, uh, we had one this year where, you know, I was on the phone. It was a, an evening game, and I was on the phone that night with the parents and the next morning with the, the principal from the other school, and the athletic directors were talking to each other all before 9 a.m. the next morning. And I think there's a message that's sent in that implementation. We're not going to sort of wait around for it. Um, so I think it really comes down to the – the implementation and the willingness to address the issues before they become bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's not to say that they don't happen and that they're not going to happen. It's just a matter of are we willing and are we practiced at addressing them. For Coach Norman, Principal Schillinger? No? Thank you both very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great night. <laughs> Good luck. All right. So next up, we have <coughs> Assistant Superintendent Bliss for the school improvement plans. 
That's me. Let me just pull up my <clears throat> presentation here. You have in your packet a uh, presentation that's called Rutland City Public Schools Continuous Improvement Plan. I'll walk you through that. I want to thank you for your time. <coughs> And so my purpose tonight is to give you an overview and set you up for the presentations you're going to see this board meeting and next from the school principals about the specific plans that they're having <coughs> implemented in their own schools. <coughs> and the overarching big picture goals from the district kind of feed into everything and the schools feed right back into that. And what you'll see in the presentation is some continuity, I hope, that will come out also through the other presentations you'll see tonight. After I'm done, you'll hear from uh, Christy Kaludi and Suzanne Engels on the primary schools, and then you'll hear from Kerry Kors and the, and the team, uh, Megan Martin and Justine Rulin on the intermediate school. And so I'll walk through this, and if you have any questions at the end, I'm happy to answer them. All right, the first thing I want to do is give you just a quick overview of the, the ongoing work. You just heard Mr. Norman and Mr. Schillinger talk about the ongoing work of continuing to work within a situation and a culture that's coming out of a pandemic and all the impact that has. So for us in the schools, we have in every school, community building is one of the major efforts. Um, you, many of you, in fact, all of you at one point or another showed up for the portrait of a graduate work that we did in terms of forming a strategic plan that brings the school district and the community forward for the next 10 years. Um, that's the start of that work on our strategic plan. And that's part of growing forward as a community. Uh, there's been a real resurgence in face-to-face -face organizations working together. And I listed some of them there. I added to my slide in red Project Vision. Um, just so you know, uh, Matt Prouty, uh, Commander Prouty, sent out an invitation to everybody on the Project Vision listserv personal invitation, will you please come to the next Project Vision meeting? That was last Thursday. So based on his personal invitation, I made sure I went. Um, and it was a great kind of re-entry into that format. I've, I've gone virtually over the last couple of years, but even when they started meeting together again, I was like, it's easier just to do it virtually and watch, and you just don't get the same experience. You don't connect with your neighbors. Um, but I will tell you that Project Vision and all these other organizations are back up and running, wanting to do more face-to-face, -face, more community building, more positive work with us and the community. We're always ongoing in planning and trying to be nimble in how we address the needs of the students in the community. And I want to really emphasize the second to last point up there. Our faculty remain focused and caring and nurturing. <coughs> uh, Matt Prouty stood up at Project Vision and said it was a rough January, and it was. And in our schools, our faculty have had to support families and students who have endured more in an eight-day span than any educator should endure in a lifetime. And all credit to them for rallying around the kids. Um, without the school and the faculty, I, I honestly honestly don't know what some of our families would do. Um, the outstanding efforts by the recovery team led by Abby Berdowski, who's sitting back there. <laughs> She'll be up in a little bit. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Alias something else. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so there's some ongoing work that's happening. I wanted you to know about that great stuff. In our uh, continuous improvement plan, which, which we may be updating this spring into summer for the district is by June 2023, goal one, we'll reestablish an articulated K-12 curriculum. More on that in a bit. Uh, the middle school establishing uh, teacher advisories, and those are in place and going well. And you'll hear more about that when they come to present next board meeting, I'm sure. And continued to work, continued work on becoming a trauma intelligent system. All right. Before I dive into those goals, a little bit about uh, what's up with the Agency of Education. And I joked with Bill Olson about this. It's kind of like a Seinfeld monologue. What's up with the Agency of Education? <laughs> um, so uh, as of February 6th, uh, the Vermont Ag Agency of Education team, they secured a third party vendor to look at how Vermont is using and spending ESSER funds. And they're supposed to do some research and then give us some advice. We had an outreach from one of their consultants today and we'll be working back and forth with them just to make sure we're doing everything according to the book and as efficiently as we can. Um, the Agency of Education advised us recently that across the country, 
the feds are starting to notice that some places aren't spending their ESSER funds appropriately, and so they're advising us, hey, you want to make sure you're doing this correctly, because guess what? The feds, just like Mr. Fagan said, the feds love to come back later and say, I'll take that money back. Um, and the Vermont Agency of Education this spring is initiating a new assessment, a new standardized assessment called the Vermont CAP. Beat the CAP, Mr. Olson. Uh, we used to have the kneecap, which some of you might mm -hmm. remember. And Mr. Olson's cheer at, uh, at the middle school when he was there was, <coughs> beat the cap, kids, beat the cap. Um, and so more on that as it comes out. One of the things about the new assessment is it's rolling out rather quickly. The opening of the window is April 12th. We'll be back to you at a later date to talk to you about what that assessment looks like. I'd love to give you the third grade assessment and see how you do. <laughs> it's exciting. Scary. And scary. Um, <laughs> one of the things that's true is they a lot of the stuff they're they're pushing forward on this is that'll be ready in a couple of weeks. That'll be ready in a couple of weeks. So when it's ready, we'll tell you all about it. But on April twelfth, the assessment window opens, and we're excited for that. Um, so back to our goal one, uh, K to twelve curriculum realignment. This is as you've heard for the last year or two. It's a, it's a really a three year project. And so far, we worked on our prioritized standards, uh, K to 12, and proficiency scales. How do you score those <coughs> standards? <coughs> you're instructing them. This year is about scope and sequence. What's the order of business as you go through the year? And then as we go into next year, we're going to work on what's the real artistic part of this is the units of study and instructional design. So the the foundation of all this work is everybody knows the standards, everybody's identified them, everybody in the core content knows exactly what they're supposed to be doing and they're in line. And then as a teacher you get this art of what you do which is how am I going to convey these ideas and how am I going to get the kids to where I want them to be. That's the exciting part about being a teacher. That work is coming up next year as well as with aligning the assessments we use internally. And uh, our Curriculum coach Lorraine Bargman made this, made this great graphic about how the progress would go. She, she loved the, the visual of the different silos kind of feeding into one grain tube. I, I didn't grow up on a farm, but I've been around places like this. <coughs> and those things all come together in the end. Uh, AGV is a guaranteed and viable curriculum. And then so that's coming up next year, and you'll hear more about it. Um, the goal, too, on advisories, we talked a little bit about this, um, but I want you to know the teamwork at the middle school remains fantastic. Uh, Ms. Beaumont, Ms. Marsh, uh, Abby Bennett, and all the teachers there have really developed teams that work closely together trying to do engaging instruction. But the thing about advisories is the idea is to help students connect with their identity, who they are, who they want to be, how they want to have ownership in their classroom and in their school. And then also it allows the teachers to connect with homes. They make positive phone calls. And then uh, in addition, they're building small communities. If you're like me, I was kind of a, a social outcast as a kid. It's really hard to make friends if you're walking down the hall with 300 other kids. But in a small group, you might actually talk to somebody and make a connection. Um, and advisories are scheduled into each day, and they use a common approach with a format that they deliver each time they do it. And the other thing in the middle school goal is transitioning grade six through nine. So you'll see in the curriculum work, uh, the grade six, especially mathematics, taking part in a similar mathematic delivery that they do in the middle school. And then also uh, Mr. Schillinger and the team at the high school and Ms. Beaumont have made creating uh, programs and connections going forward uh, into the high school a major effort as well. And then the last goal is a trauma intelligent system. This is one of the things we talk about a lot. Um, it, it, it's a part of every school. It's a part of every, every place. And people often ask, like, well, what, what does that trauma intelligent mean? Why do you need to talk about how to understand how kids think, the way they work? And so I, I always work on trying to establish the need. Why is that important? And the data point I always go back to is back in 2013, 16% of the births were opiate exposed. I'd like to see that data now. I've got to find out who does public health and um, see what the opiate exposed births are these days. The reason that's important is, is if you have 200 kindergarten kids coming in, that's 32 kids who exist in families that are either 
still active in addiction or working in recovery and all the supports and things that go with that. Um, and that's a lot. And so that's one reason. 70% um, of our incoming kindergartners have at least two adverse childhood experiences. You can check out the ACEs study if you want to know more. Happy to talk to you about that. And we have this thing called the Vermont Youth Project Survey, which students in the middle and high school take. Here's recent data from 2022. 24% of the kids uh, reported being upset in the last month because of something happened that was unexpected in their lives. That's one-fourth of our kids. 44% reported feeling nervous and stressed. Okay. This is, this, you have to think backwards in this one. 27% of the middle school students were confident in their ability to handle their personal problems. Do the math. <laughs> What's the percentage of kids that aren't confident in their ability to handle their personal problems? 73%. So we have kids that, that are worried, like, can I handle what I've got on my plate? Um, disconnection as a result of the pandemic. In the 2021 data, more than 50% of our 7th through 12th grade students said that the pandemic had a, an adverse impact on their lives just in terms of their connections. And that, that holds true. That holds true. Action. So the advisories, what we do to address that. Uh, professional development. You may hear about it from our K-6 to team, but we're sending a team of 30 caring, nurturing, and wonderful faculty administrators on their vacation. They volunteered to go to a conference in Houston, Texas. Second year, we sent a team on the topic of building trauma-intelligent <coughs> schools and restorative schools so that kids have great places to be. And the idea is that we're developing and cultivating leaders in that. Um, we're paying for it through ESSER funds, which is great for us, but the real investment is the time of caring people that say that would be vacation time, but they're going to this conference. And I really appreciate that. I want to acknowledge that. Um, and then uh, working on restorative practices, you may hear about that. And when it says tier one efforts, that is not necessarily so. If I have a child that's got a problem in my class, who can I send them to? We certainly have those supports. But the idea is that in every, every arena that you're in, we want caring, cultivated communities that kids can be a part of. You know, and where we don't do that, we fail. So that's our goal. Um, and then, wow, this is my last chance before the vote on March 7th. I want you to know the ballot is out. If you followed that link, or you can find the link on the, the city website, you can see the ballots up there, and we hope everyone votes. Uh, as educators, we believe in the importance of voting, and that's civic duty. Your vote is your voice, so get out and vote. And then, this is my surprise ending. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day. Who would have ever seen that? Is it, which, cam which camera's on, man? <laughs> Hi, Ginger. Um, I'm sure it's got a good so shot of your tie, you know? And uh, if you had any questions for now, I'd be happy to answer them. <coughs> questions for Rob? Excellent. Well, I thank you. Okay. And, and I'm going to step aside, and I'm going to allow the primary principals to step up and offer their presentation to you, followed by the intermediate school principals. Here you go, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. All right, good evening. I'm Christy Flutie, principal at Northwest. Uh, I'm Suzanne Eagles, principal at Northeast. So we are gonna start our presentation with just um, a couple of demographics, just to give you a sense of who we are. So <clears throat> Northeast School, uh, this slide has us at 90, <laughs> 197. Well, I think we hit 200 last week, but um, <laughs> so we got a, got about 200 students, 28% um, of them, uh, plus another 20% of them have some sort of a uh, plan, whether it's special education, education support plan, or a 504 plan um, for delays or dis disabilities. And um, we also provided uh, the number percentage, um, our three, three and a half percent of our students uh, are experiencing that we know of homelessness. So that's Northeast. And at Northwest, our student enrollment is 163 students. 22% of our population qualifies for special education services. 
our educational support team or 504 team, um, about 23% of our students qualify for a plan under those services, and we are experiencing uh, about 4% of homelessness at Northwest. So the first area we are going to be talking about um, is our common wellness plan between the two schools. Um, one thing I found um, just arriving here in Rutland City is that Northeast and Northwest work extremely close. So um, we thought it would be appropriate to present out on what both of uh, the schools are doing. So over the past couple of years, um, we've had a focus on curriculum, instructional practices, assessment, interventions, and social emotional learning. This is also called the recovery plan. Um, COVID's had some impacts on our children and we're working hard to build their skills both academically, socially, and emotionally. In terms of curriculum, if you can see up there, um, teachers meet multiple times a month to align the common core standards with their primary instruction. The curriculum work is um, also being done in uh, English language arts, math, and social studies at this time. For example, in second grade, uh, students at both schools may be working on uh, measurement or comparing numbers. They may be working on addition and subtraction facts. So when our teachers meet across the towns, they can have a common um, understanding of what's going on in the classrooms. Um, given that teachers are constantly refining their instruction, they need to understand the curriculum. They have been unpacking the standards and basically this means that they're analyzing the standard, um, the language in each standard and focusing on two aspects of what really the students need to know, which is the essential knowledge and essential skills. They teach um, concepts based on these areas and then create assessments to, ter to determine the students' understandings. Um, it's been great just to participate. Uh, one, one Thursday a week it may be ELA, the second may be math and Suzanne and I are able to bounce in and out of the meetings and just listen to their conversations. And I've been able to see a lot of consistencies um, between the grade levels, which has been really nice. Um, one thing we've been doing is participating in a lot of common professional development between the two schools. So this year we've um, been really focusing on Daily Five, which is a literacy uh, um, framework. Um, all teachers have received Daily Five training and when you walk into the primary classrooms during literacy, you can see the components across both schools. Um, one thing we've been able to do as a district admin group is do some walkthroughs. So when we're in each building, the whole admin, be Bill and Rob and Suzanne and you know other uh, administrators, we are given uh, areas to identify and we can look at commonalities between the classrooms and then talk about it at the end and then we give the feedback to the teachers so that that way as an admin group we're looking for consistencies in the classroom um, and teachers have been extremely appreciative of this and really open to having everybody come in um, in math we're going to be adopting a new program so we're going to be starting professional development around that and um, continue with the collaboration between the two schools <laughs> Um, another targeted area of focus is defining each tier of instruction. We're working really hard on strengthening our tier one instruction. Tier one is basically the foundation of learning which all students have access to. So if you have a strong foundation in tier one, then we will have uh, less of a need for our tier two and tier three and support services. Um, this is called the multi-tiered systems of support. So if you're listening and you hear that MTSS, that's what it's about. So this is the academic side to that, and Suzanne will speak to the behavioral side. Uh, we both have interventionists to support students in areas of literacy and math. And we are monitoring students' progress very closely and constantly revisiting data. So that is one thing I see that um, our primary schools are really good at, is focusing on data. All of the decisions we make is based upon data, um, at Northwest at the beginning of the school year. We didn't necessarily have a common data tool, so we built something at Northwest, and then they've been able to share the, the um, tool with Northeast just so we are, collecting data can be time consuming for sure, right? So we're trying to make it easier and effective for teachers. So I think that has been really uh, valuable this year. Another significant task that we have at hand is calibrating our report cards. We want to make sure that when teachers are giving out a, re, uh, a grade or a scale that it's a common practice. So that way when they go to the intermediate school, they're you know um, both having the same measures that are consistent. So that's one thing that we're going to be working on um, between, the, between the two schools. Okay. 
So thanks, Christy. Thank you. So the uh, <coughs> second part of our continuous improvement plan involves social, emotional, behavioral learning. And um, that should not be surprising, hearing a lot about that. It's been a big part of th those, that learning and competencies, competencies are a big part of the COVID recovery plan. And it's also, uh, we saw those competencies. I don't know why I tried to say that word again twice when I struggled so much the first time. Just throw it out again. <coughs> Anyways, that was a big part of the portrait of a grad plan um, also. So I um, want to say that social emotional skills are um, important and uh, at our schools they're um, taught right along with reading and math and science, technology, arts, phys ed. Um, we do a lot of teaching, particularly the primary schools, around mm -hmm. social emotional learning. And uh, some, some points around this are that um, our students aren't, um, you know, they don't know how to zip a, a zipper or snap something fine uh, right off, and they don't know how to, uh, how to solve a very complex calculus problem early on. Um, likewise, they don't know how to uh, solve a complex social or emotional problem, and um, we have to teach that. And when we see social emotional problems at school, we respond to it in a way that's consistent to how we respond to students who don't quite know uh, complex calculus problems. So if there's a um, problem or a mistake made in calculus, we, um, we don't punish or send them home for a day. We teach them, right? Likewise, uh, when we have kids with difficult problems and behaviors, we know we've got to teach them more. We've got to build these competencies. We don't uh, respond to it with just a punishing or sending them home for a day kind of approach. We teach these skills. So it's a big part of what we do. And uh, the overhead or the handout that you see kind of summarizes the three approaches that we use in teaching uh, social emotional learning. Typically, um, what we do is we help students to learn how to regulate, to relate, uh, and how to repair uh, problems or mistakes. So on that handout, the bottom section um, is what Rob was talking about as far as trauma, trauma-informed teaching and learning. Uh, we do a lot of uh, focusing training for teachers and work with students even in understanding what are the signs of uh, trauma and what uh, what, how uh, anxiety affects our brains and our behaviors and our learning. And we work with teachers around that. We work with students around um, how to respond with our nervous system to get regulated. Because if we're not regulated and we're in defense mode, we're not learning or relating. So a huge part of what we do around trauma is around regulating and relating. Then the next section, nope, not the next page yet, but the next section of that handout is we do a lot of our social emotional learning around positive behavior interventions. PBIS relates a lot to a positive culture and relationships. The idea behind that is we want our kids to learn and they're not gonna learn well if they don't feel successful, cared for, or worthy. So PBIS builds positives, decreases the negatives through um, reinforcing teaching and celebrating the good things. We'll be open to, to questions in one, one second. Then the, the third is uh, we do a uh, lot of work around restorative practices. The idea behind that is that we want to help our students to learn the impact of their problem behaviors or emotions. We want them to understand the impact of it and we want them to uh, correct or fix any um, damage to things or to relationships and that's that's a large part of how we do restorative practices so I'm just going to give some examples of each of those with some cute little pictures and then we'll open it up to questions so the first picture is uh, some of our primary kids in restorative circles so they meet in a, in a group and they discuss a theme and they dis or discuss a problem or a great situation and they look at the impact of those events and how to fix or how, it, um, how to um, correct those situations. So those are some examples of our school kids doing restorative. The next slide are some examples of how our schools do PBIS. 
So you see some puppets. Those puppets teach skills, like they teach about cooperation or sharing. So we teach the skills and we do all sorts of activities where our kids have to use those, those character and, and social emotional skills well. And then we also have a lot of celebrations for students who have gone, gone above and beyond and exemplify those skills. So that's a little taste of PBIS. And then the last slide is just uh, an example of some of the trauma-sensitive, trauma-informed approaches that we use. One of the pictures is, a, is uh, a corner. Most of our classrooms have little corners. Gone are the dunce chairs or think time chairs, out. time out chairs. Look, <laughs> instead, we now have calm corners, <coughs> right? Um, we don't go and feel ashamed and wear that pointy <laughs> cap. Instead, we just go and kind of remove ourselves from the situation and use skills to calm down, regulate our nervous system so that we can think and relate better. So that's one picture there. And then we also have a picture of some lessons being taught around uh, regulation and zones of regulation. So those are some examples of Northeast and Northwest using our, our social emotional learning lessons and teaching those skills and I think that's it for our presentation so we're open to questions Karen? I just had a question as far as the trauma that some of the students go through how do you find out about that I mean is it do anybody the police contact you and let you know what this child may have gone through or do you not find out until the child comes to school and there's issues how does that exactly work? A lot, lot of different ways. Lot of okay. Different ways, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everything you just said. All, well, all because I, I was yeah. just thinking, um, you know, with with Rob attending the Project Vision, that might be something to work on with the police department. Is that when they notice, you know, or have young kids that are involved in situations like that, that they make an attempt to make sure that, you know, at least someone within the school system is notified. So you can be more aware of it. And I think they do. We have um, uh, Officer LaGuardia, who's oh, the okay. resource right, office. Oh, okay, right, the school resource officer. Officer, and I, I mean, I know a lot of communications come through Robin Bill to okay. us. Okay, So, and oftentimes the kids will walk in. Like, these guys don't know about it. It may not be a legal thing. Um, many mornings, our students are coming in and disclosing things that are very traumatic in their lives. Right. So I think it just depends. Um, but I will, I do feel very, um, supported with the you know Rutland City Police okay, good. and Robin Bell as a contact for sure. Yeah. And we also have good good relationships with social services and mental yeah. health and so collaboration can only make things better when it comes to uh, families experiencing difficult things and, and uh, the impact on our students. And between the schools I will say because oftentimes we have siblings. Right. So like we may reach out to uh, RAS if they you know just that open communication has been very helpful for me for sure. Great. Kathy? Do you feel like you have the resources you need, especially <coughs> around uh, social, emotional, and trauma aspects of, of your days? We've, with the we've kids? got a great team. I'm pretty proud of, of the uh, counseling and behavioral support mm -hmm. systems in our schools. We've been paying attention to this for a long time. Would it be better if we had twice the staff? Uh, of course, <laughs> I'm, of course, we love it. <laughs> But are we handling it? We're doing a good. Yeah. We're doing a great job. But what I hear you saying is that you need more people. More people with young kids who who have difficulties and, and need a lot of support is often is often helpful. <laughs> but I, I feel like we are lucky relative to a lot of a lot of schools in the state. Yeah. We've got a great counseling support service. Amazing. I I feel very fortunate having the supports that we do. We have full time <coughs> school supervisors in our buildings, counselors special educator like I feel very blessed with the amount of staffing we have honestly there are shortages in staffing as far as paraeducators and bus drivers that just lack of individuals to do like the job right. not necessarily yeah you know, yeah. yeah that impacts how easy it is to work with behaviors but we are staffed and have very skilled very counseling skilled, yeah. staff thank you and I would feel open asking for more help if we needed it. You know, I don't feel, I, we, you know, I meet weekly with Rob. I have conversations with Bill. I feel like it would be a very easy conversation just to, but I feel very well staffed. Thank you for all that you do and continue to do. Maybe.
You have techniques for an adult calming corner? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know, I want sure. one. Sure. Thank you for all you're yeah. doing. I mean, this is, this is crazy. Like, I just think it's, yeah. it's just, thanks for the update. It's just so, we actually, um, had, we actually had a, quite a bit of training last year that focused not just on regulating our kids, but, I mean, it's a joke, yeah. but. Yeah, yeah, I didn't mean, yeah, I kind of meant it as a joke, but it, it's, it's also serious yeah. for, we, we, yeah, for yeah, the if teachers. If we're not like, regulated and yeah. our kids are not. So we do it. We do spend a lot of time helping ourselves. And, and we do support each other too. To we have stay a regulated. monthly staff restorative circle just to check in how people are feeling. We have our counselors assigned to teachers to sh just to check in, yeah. you know, making oh, sure they're good. okay, yeah. Yeah. Right, making sure our counselor's okay, but yeah. Yeah, okay. Yep. Sure. Thank you. Right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. <coughs> I'm Carrie Kors. With me, our assistant principals, Justine Rulin, Megan Martin. Um, we are thankful to have the opportunity to highlight the intermediate school to all of you. Uh, you will notice after listening to primaries that there are many, many similarities. Um, that is purposeful. We have, as I think Rob said earlier, um, really made a concerted effort to be more aligned with our programs and our practices and it shows we're we're seeing the difference um, coming through the primaries what that means for you right now is we're gonna be a lot shorter because <laughs> it hurts so much um, so I'm gonna talk to you first about uh, who we are and kind of what our core values are Justine's gonna talk to you about how we use the data that we collect as you heard, you know, we collect a lot of data. Um, and then Megan's going to share with you uh, kind of our goals going forward, what we're looking at. So who we are, we, and look here because I can't quite see that. Um, <laughs> it seems pretty far. Um, at our last count, uh, we have 477 students. And as Suzanne mentioned, um, I, don't, I don't know what happened, but we just recently have had quite an influx of uh, people registering, some um, planning to start after our break, but we've had quite a few. Um, I believe those are done in March, our enrollment numbers like become official, so I'm, I'm sure that'll be increased. Uh, we have 22% of our population is identified for special education, 29% are identified as needing um, some kind of support in terms of an educational <coughs> support plan. Uh, we have 5% that are identified on a 504 plan, and um, we also have 6%, we're up to 6% that we know of um, that are considered homeless at this time. There are the three of us that are a um, pretty cohesive team. We have, we are fortunate that um, this year we were able to increase our counseling staff, so we have seven counselors. Uh, there are 28 classroom teachers. We have nine third grades, <laughs> six fourth grades, seven fifth grades, and six sixth grades. So um, we have 11 special educators, three interventionists, and then of course we have our, our specialists. Uh, you can see, it doesn't matter what they're doing, um, we just love the smiles on everybody's faces, staff and students alike. A um, lot of supports, uh, even some, we can see some therapy um, animals there, which is always well received by our students. Um, when we think about our, like our core values, what do we as a whole school um, really um, respond to? We, we are tight with our restorative practices. We are, um, we have a dedicated community block, and um, we follow the PBIS uh, support system. So what, what does that really mean? Uh, you hate to sound redundant, but um, our restorative approaches really uh, focuses on repairing relationships, resolving conflicts, and addressing harm uh, that has occurred. And, and as Suzanne mentioned, it, any kind of harm, it can be harm to a um, property or a relationship um, and it, it, our restorative 
um, approaches happen in either uh, whole class settings, small group settings, um, just any, any very various combination. Um, there's always a protocol that's followed and res respect shown by everyone. Because um, if they're not ready to repair, then it, it's, it's not gonna work. So we wait until they're ready. Um, you heard uh, Lauren share earlier that our um, school-wide celebration just happened. Um, we really focus on, you know, let's highlight the positive, who's following our expectations, um, and let's reward that. So that's, that's our big focus there. And then our community block is something um, we found much success with, and uh, our entire school, um, our 28 classrooms, all start their morning with um, a circle, and they all have an assigned community partner, and the intent is, once again, to continue to foster relationships within the school. So um, you might have a fourth grade teacher who her partner um, could be a special educator. And every day for the first um, half hour of the day, those two <coughs> teachers are in there together. So there's always two professional staff. Um, that was just a really calm, easy way for everyone to start their day. Um, kind of check in. You mentioned, Karen, about, um, you know, how do we know? K kids tell us, you know, they tell us um, sometimes right in the circle. And um, so what we did this year was we included an end of the day closing circle, which is nice because um, every class now ends with that <coughs> circle and that community partner comes back into the end of the day to close out their day um, with the class also. So it has been, um, it's, it's my favorite time of the day, to be certain. Um, right. Yep, school-wide. Um, so some of our programs that we have, uh, in addition to what was mentioned, um, we have a fine arts block that is, um, uh, again, when you think about what uh, Coach Norman shared, we have um, after-school programs as well. We have... Um, jazz band, orchestra, handbells, um, I'm missing another musical. Of course, I was going to say chess club. Yeah, but I was thinking music. But we, yeah, we have chess club, we have art club, we have um, community service club, we have student council, um, and those are all after school things that um, students participate in. In addition to, we started our fine arts block. Um, so depending on your grade level, you're going to have a 40, 45 minute um, block of time <coughs> twice a week that is focused on chorus, orchestra, or band. And we have uh, over 300, mm -hmm. over 300 of our kids um, that participate <coughs> in that, in one, one of those activities. Um, we are fortunate, we have Adam Brewer, who is our uh, technology teacher and he integrates with all of our classrooms um, so we have some pretty cool things thanks to Patricia's support with that um, a lot of fun things happening teacher or kids learning how to you know just do things that are far beyond my scope um, let's just leave it at that um, we have a, a room designated uh, for kids to, we have the common corners, but we also have a room, um, it's called our pod room, and it is uh, positive opportunities for development. So um, it's for kids who, they know they, the day might be long, so they'll have um, scheduled breaks in that room, just for an activity, a check-in with the adult that's in there. Um, that has been very helpful. You, um, we used to partner with Rutland Mental Health and have, uh, my apologies to Rutland Mental Health because they used to call it VOPE, Vermont Outdoor Adventure. We have nothing more creative. We now call it ROPE. <laughs> <laughs> so it is uh, the Rutland uh, Outdoor Adventure Program. Um, we also uh, are so thankful to be able to have Everyone Wins back in our building with in-person um, mentors from the community 
meeting with uh, their, our students one-on-one -on -one at, at their lunchtime um, on Mondays and Tuesdays. And I know we still have kids, so if anybody's interested in helping um, be a reader with a student, uh, we, you can contact me and I'll set you up. Um, and then we continue to partner with the Vermont Food Bank and added this year, um, Everyone Eats as a site at the intermediate school. So I, I know we've reported on that before, but um, it's been well received by our family and staff because um, it's for everyone. So people have really benefited from that. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we're gonna transition to look at some of our data. Um, and see how our efforts at our, at our school over the last few years manifest through a lens of data. Um, collecting, analyzing, and action planning with data is a cornerstone of our leadership practice at the Intermediate School, and we are consistently looking at our behavioral data. We do this with a variety of teams, as an administrative team, with our counseling team, with our team leaders, um, and with our teachers. And we do this at the end of the school year to recap our, our year. And then we review that over the summertime and set goals to go over this data with our teachers when they come back um, in the new school year. And then we do a mid-year check-in as well to see how we're doing. In addition to looking at this data, we also conduct stakeholder surveys with our students, our staff, and our families. And we do that three times per year, roughly around the time of the end of the trimester. And so we have our data to look at, and then we also have the anecdotal experience of our stakeholders to share how they're feeling about our practices in our school. Basically a climate and culture survey. Last year, the data that you're looking at here, we looked at the types of behaviors and where these behaviors were happening in our school. And then we looked at the survey feedback from our students, from our staff, and from our families, and we saw there was a correlation in what students were feeling out on the playground what our teachers were reporting about incidents that were happening on the playground, and then what families were hearing about when their students came home. So if you look at this pie chart on last year's school year, you're gonna see that 31% of the incidents that were documented at our school happened on the playground. And so over the course of the summer, we sat down and said, what can we do to decrease the number of incidents that are happening on our playground? So let's take a look at the next page. As a team, we discussed a variety of options, but we also consulted with our team leaders and our counselors um, and our teachers, because it's a collaborative effort to bring about school improvement. So each grade level's recess was split into two sections. We have over 100 students in each grade level. That's a lot of children to be out on the playground together. So we split that into two to have half the number out there. Um, we reviewed the annual behavior data um, and did that with our teachers and ended up adding a 10 minute mindfulness moment to use those calm down spaces or to listen to a meditation or to just have a few minutes after lunch and recess to calm down before transitioning to an academic block. We used some of our ESSER funds um, to provide additional supports to recess um, so that our students could participate in structured games and activities. Um, and then we redistributed our staffing um, so that we had more professional staff who have solid relationships with our students out on the playground with our, with our kids. And then the administrators worked um, to cover the cafeteria so that we're all working to build those relationships with our students throughout the day. And then we also provided layer three support so students that have um, more behavioral incidents um, so they can have access to recess in smaller settings as well. So as a result of the com compounded efforts um, that we've talked about here, our last data analysis shows that 11% of our behavioral referrals are happening out on the playground at this time. So it's a great progress. <coughs> so bad you can't <laughs> see me over the computer. So as you may have heard throughout our talking, we have three big priorities that we have been focusing on this year at RIS. Community health and safety, <laughs> thank you. Community health and safety, restorative practices, and ELA curriculum development. So if we start with community health and safety, um, we have been using the I Love You Guys community safety protocol. So the three admin have been working really hard at what do we do if there is an emergency situation at school. The I Love You Guys protocol is very thick, it's very <laughs> thorough. Um, so we have spent a ton of time designating which staff has which roles and practicing drills so that in the event of a variety of emergencies, we are well prepared in our big building. Um, in addition to community health and safety, the district has 
made a process for a risk assessment. So it's a questionnaire for suicide and threat assessment that the RIS counseling staff is trained in and administrators. Um, and we also have designated time for staff to gather in a circle, we call them PLCs, professional learning communities, and go through a variety of topics related to community health and safety. So those are meetings that just the staff participate in once a month. The admin don't go to those staff meetings on purpose, so it allows for a little bit of freedom within our staff to reflect upon areas of concern or strengths or things that they need adjusted to, and then team leaders report back out on common themes to us. Uh, we also do that in a circle on purpose to help establish that restorative practices are a thing that our entire school is participating in, not just our students. So that brings us to restorative practices. Again, you've heard a lot about that tonight, so I will keep it brief. Um, this is our second year at RIS with a, a very concentrated focus on restorative practices. As Carrie mentioned, we've been doing community block for a number of years, but we have made a very big shift and how we respond to behavior at RIS. And we have partnered with Suffolk University. Um, so Suffolk University came to RIS this past summer and trained staff in tier one, so staff that had not been through restorative practices or needed a really good refresher. And then tier two, so staff that had been through restorative practices recently and sort of had a, a grasp. So we had two different layers of staff that were trained this summer. Um, and then they provide ongoing coaching for us throughout the school year. ELA curriculum and development. The district has made a lot of efforts for curriculum development over the past year. Um, and at RIS specifically, we have been working on the daily five. So similar to the primary schools, we want that vertical alignment, meaning what they're doing at the primary schools is translating to what we are doing at RIS. So our third and fourth grade teachers have been working on the daily five. They were trained over the summer. And when we do our walkthroughs across the school, those are things that us as admin are looking for in practice. So our ongoing steps, uh, this, this is a bulleted list sort of, of us reaching our <coughs> goals. So some of these we have gone over, like the daily five. We also have ongoing professional development in, for upcoming illustrative math programming that will be happening through grades three through six. We had four rounds of EST, so EST stands for Educational Support Team. So we have students that may need like a boost of a skill block throughout their day in an academic area, usually ELA or math and that's provided through EST, so it's a service prior to a possibility of needing an IEP. We are using FastBridge and FNP, Fontes and Pinnell for our assessments. That gets done three times a year. We continue to collaborate across grade levels, so grade level teams meet and discuss curriculum. We have professional learning goals aligned with our academic school-wide goals. So we were doing a lot, I think, for academic, especially considering we ju are just coming off the pandemic. So we're working on a lot of recovery work, but also what's moving us forward. For SEL and behavior, we have our restorative practices, we have community block, mindfulness breaks, things we didn't talk about tonight as our sensory pathway. So on the bottom floor of RIS is our third grade wing, what we call the dungeon gym, right, if you're a graduate <laughs> of RIS. Um, <coughs> there's a really nice sensory pathway that's been waxed over on the floor. So it's a very permanent feature. Students can take a break from class and do bear crawls, crab crawls, walk forward, walk backward, hopscotch. Um, pretty fun. It's also fun to do it with students along the hallways. Mm -hmm. Can I just add, it's also yes. fun if you have to, for whatever reason, look at the video and you see kids all by themselves <laughs> like doing their little <laughs> <hopscotch>. <laughs> I have to remember that when I do it down the hall. <laughs> Um, Justine mentioned our stakeholder surveys, so those are given out to students, staff, and families. I, I want to put a plug in for how important and valuable those are to us as an admin team um, in terms of getting a grip on what's happening in our building and how people are feeling about our building. We really appreciate family and student feedback, especially because some of, some of the times those are not things that we always hear. You know, we have a very big building and it's hard to reach all the time everyone who's engaged and those stakeholder surveys provide an outlet to grab information. And then we also have partnerships with ROPE, <laughs> the <laughs> RIS Outdoor <laughs> Adventure Program, and Allen Street Campus, which has been a really nice partnership. That wraps up our slideshow at RIS. We have one more, more pictures up there. Um, this year our PBIS theme is bees, so here's your beekeepers <laughs> up here. 
And our <laughs> expectations are be kind, be your best, be brave, be you, be RIS. If anyone has any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Evan? I've been thinking about um, the elementary schools mentioned how, much, how, how many homeless kids we have. How do we, how do you find out about that and what kind of special outreach or services to those kids? And what do we do to help those kids? Great question. So um, typically we find out via students or a parent will call and report that they're experiencing homelessness. It usually is around the need of transportation. So how do I get my kids to school? Can they still come to Rutland City? Um, and because we are their home school, we provide transportation. So organizing transportation is the priority to school. Um, that has certainly been a feat. Partnerships with Glennet Maintenance and Rob have been a huge help with that. Mm -hmm. And then our counseling staff completes, um, I don't want to say a worksheet, but a form to help with the collaboration between the homeless liaisons and housing authority. So that, and then turns into if a family hasn't already been connected to a housing program, that allows for the counselors to help reach out and advocate for some of that to happen, um, in addition to a, a family being able to know that these are the services available in our community. Good, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I was late yeah. to my raising my arm. Um, uh, the um, the tier one, two, three, is is that part of the restorative approaches? Is that? Uh, are you talking about MTSS? Ooh. I think so. Yeah. Maybe. Yes. 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 I support. think so. Yeah. 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 So no. No. Okay. No, nope. that's separate. The uh, multi-tier, that's kind of like a universal <coughs> um, support that you would give pretty much to your whole class. Right, so it's consistent. And then a tier two would be, as um, Megan said, maybe somebody just needs a little boost on a particular skill. Like they're just a little bit of support is needed, um, there would be a level two. And if they you know, need a little more, then um, we would move them to a level three. And that's, that would be with the interventionist. That would is, that, <coughs> is this behavior or academic? Both. Both, okay, got it. Yeah. Yeah, okay. 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 Thank you. So if you think about it, um, the state uses like a triangle as a visual for it. So universal would be the, the base of the triangle. Like this applies to the majority of the students. And then as you move up the triangle, the tiers move up too, right? So tier one's at the bottom, tier two's in the middle, tier three, and then tier four, special ed 504 would be the tippy top. But we also use that to refer to behavior. <laughs> um, so it does get, I understand your okay, confusion. That's a, yeah. So okay. I said restorative practices tier two and tier one when I was presenting and what I was referring to is tier two would be staff that had already had training in restorative practices tier one we were beginning training for restorative practices yeah. so I, I no that's great it's like acronyms right yeah. There's one for everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah thank you I appreciate the yeah good question thank you, thank you. Kevin so there, I'm hearing about a lot of specialized training for teachers about different kinds of practices how much of that training gets passed on to subs, and how do you do that? <coughs> Good question. <laughs> um, well, we have uh, very few consistent subs, um, and so when they're in the building enough, um, they start to just understand our practice, practices, mostly by modeling or, you know, checking in. Um, given suggestions, you know, they know like who to call kind of thing when, when there's a question. Um, but beyond that, you know, usually, and I think somebody said it, we're, although we have a good number of staff, people are out a lot. And um, so it, it seems that at times, um, you know, when we, when we have one sub that might be in, we would, uh, really try to prioritize and while they're getting ready we're trying to fill all the other holes that that are missing that day so there, there's not a lot of time for that um, but it's obviously a need that's something uh, is that something we should be planning for to provide more training for subs in some way do you need extra staff to do that or? Wouldn't hurt. Wouldn't hurt, okay. <laughs> and if, um, 
yeah, if you can help fight the cause to get more subs, <laughs> that would help too. Yeah. Yeah. When, when Rob Rob interviews every sub that comes into the district and you know goes through a process and helps helps them understand what the culture is and what how the, the systems work. Then within the buildings, of course, every building is a little different. Sure. Um, but what you have in um, most of the buildings, I think, is there's usually a core group of people that are doing most of the subs. There's, they could be, you know, we, with as a big a school as theirs, they could have a, a few people out every day and that you might have the same sub constantly. So they could start to learn the system and start to learn the processes, the culture. Um, and then as administrators, you want to make sure um, that it's going well and you're going to check in with those people. And, and um, if something goes awry, then you're going to correct that and teach that and make sure that the, the person as a staff member is is doing the same things that everybody else is doing. Makes sense. Is is the scale large enough that do you have any like full time subs? No. No. Okay. Would that be helpful? It's not what it's not what what we practice. But okay. Yeah. All right. I mean, there's people that come pretty frequently. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we we have one sub who comes every day, just about every day. And if we're lucky, we'll oh, get a couple more. <laughs> um, but okay, thank you. Where do you think all the new students are coming from? Are they maybe homeschooled kids coming back from COVID, or just no? Um, they really all over. We're getting them from all over Vermont. We're getting uh, one we just got from like Oregon, um, okay. Florida. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, all moving. There's no rhyme or reason, really. Okay. And they're finding places to live. Um, yeah. Many are, of our recent ones are in the hotels. Before you dismiss so, this class. Yes, <laughs> I was going to say. Before you dismiss. It's great mm -hmm. that we have such a great working team between our um, our mm -hmm. levels of schools, mm -hmm. and I think does Mr. Olson have some yeah, some thunder to bring? So let's see, about an hour and a half ago, you approved the appointment of Justine Ruin as the new principal at Northeast. <laughs> I just wanted to say a few words about Justine. She taught social studies and was an administrator at a school in uh, South Dakota. She's been at, at RIS for the past three years. And as I, this is what happens when you go last. You have to say the same thing that everybody else said. All <laughs> but uh, curriculum development, she's worked on multi-tiered systems of support, positive behavior intervention and support, the impact of poverty and homelessness on our students, and helped lead with the implementation of trauma-informed and restorative practices at RAS, but you knew that already. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I wanted to say, uh, that, you know, the screening committee does the research for this for this appointment, and um, the leader of the screening committee, Pam Reed, wrote to me and said, here's what we found, and gave this big two-page report, and I wanted to read a quote from that, and maybe you two could add on if you there's anything else you want to add. Um, but they said about Justine, Justine's kindness, warmth, confidence, compassion, and reflective nature were just a few of the personal characteristics observed in the interview and reported by those who worked with Justine. Justine demonstrates confidence, professionalism, and an approachable demeanor. And on the committee, the screening committee, were Sarah and Charlene. I don't, is there anything else you wanted to add about that? Or yeah, I'd like, um, so the, Go ahead. the committee was about, I'm going to say, 10 people. Um, mixture of people, administration, teachers, parents, school board commissioners, um, and I felt that um, Justine was um, just by far, well, she, 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 she's very presentable, she's very well spoken, she's engaged, she's very knowledgeable, her, her background is very interesting, mm -hmm. um, she has um, great experience. And I think that she's got some big shoes to fill, but I have no doubt that she's going to dig in and come up with, she's got great ideas. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what Justine's going to bring. So I'm pleased. We're lucky to have her. Yeah. 
And uh, when we were doing the, the process, um, one of the first things we did was make a list of different things that we would look for in somebody in this position. And when we finished the list initially, because there was a lot of things that got combined, like a lot of different words that could be used to explain one thing, but um, somebody commented, <laughs> yeah. If you could find that person, that would be great. That's my best friend. Right. <laughs> my best friend. <laughs> She's my best friend now. <laughs> I know. That's, everyone and, wants that for a And best so <laughs> when, when we went through um, this interview process, everybody was, like, showing their lists to each other because we had, like, highlighted most of the list when she finished her interview. And uh, <laughs> it was like... And then when we were talking later about all the candidates, we s everyone started with, well, Justine's in. I mean, we don't even have to talk about her. Everybody, she wins. <laughs> but the, and then we were talking about the other ones. So it was just, it was really um, exciting that um, she seems so young and so fresh-faced and, you know, energetic. <laughs> but then when she talks about her history and what she's done, it's, like, amazing that she's really got a lot of experience with, like, um, working with... Um, was it South Dakota? Mm -hmm. Out in South Dakota with the with the indigenous tribes, and um, that was really interesting because that's a really interesting point of view to already have at such a young age and such a, you know, beginning. You feel really young to me. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, no, I just, it's very exciting. I'm very excited that our school gets her, and, um, I mean, we already had her, but, you know, I'm very excited for her position in the next school, too. And, yes, very big shoes to fill, and I think she's going to do it really well. So, just really excited. So. So yeah. I, I just wanted to note the people who were on the um, the screening committee just and thank them for mm -hmm. the, on behalf of the community. So Pam Pam Reed led the group. Sarah Bedard was a parent. Sarah and Charlene as board members. Anna Walker as guidance counselor. Lucy Davin as teacher. Joanne Piontek as paraeducator. Heather Olson administrative assistant. And Christy Kaludi as a partner principal. And Sarah, Sarah uh, Sharon Napolitano as coordinator of support services. So I thank them for doing a lot of work. It takes a lot of work to do that. Thank you for the time that you put into it too. And we said all these good things. I don't. I don't want to leave you. No, thank you. Thank you for your very <laughs> kind words and for the trust of the board and your confidence. Uh, I'm really excited to work um, with the youngest students in our district. It's a great honor. Um, I think you can imagine it's bittersweet for me to be departing RIS and belong to such an incredible administrative team there. Um, but I feel lucky to be inheriting Suzanne's work at, the, at Northeast. I think she's going to set me up to be in a great position to lead effectively um, and I'm looking forward to partnering with other K-6 administrators um, and of course working with the incredible community at Northeast. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks Justine. Um, so we have another administrative opening. I just want to update the board on that progress. Uh, Rob is leading that team, and it's composed of a, a similar screening team that Northeast had, including Kevin. Kevin's volunteering on that. And we are going through that process and hoping to have a recommendation maybe in the next few weeks. It's, it's, this is a, a job market is scant in the applicants out there, so it, in everywhere, everywhere you go. So we're working hard to uh, find a, a really good candidate. So. That's that update. Um, I wanted to talk to the board and the community. We had a, a swatting incident that happened last uh, week in Vermont. And it didn't actually occur in our schools. But I just wanted to talk a little bit about it, what happened. It occurred also in California and Michigan. Um, so you know, if you don't know the, the term, a swatting call is when someone makes a false report intentionally to the police. Um, and in this case, uh, you know, schools get notified, police show up to the school, schools ended up, the schools around the state went into lockdown, uh, a, a lockdown stance. And of course it's going to cause a lot of disruption and it's a lot of stress, a lot of fear. People are very, very um, anxious about what happened. Um, there were 21 schools in Vermont that this happened to last week. And, um, you know, as we heard about it through the morning of that day, we started hearing rumors about it. We actually heard about it through staff members who had connections to these different schools. And then we got word from the state police. The state police are really good in, in our local police as well as, as far in so far as connecting us to uh, issues that are going on around the state. So we got an email from the state police that said, this is happening. 
Uh, and then we were shortly informed, shortly later informed about um, the issue it, from the AOE and from the governor's office. So we had all that information confirmed, and then we said, okay, now let's let our staff know and let's let our, our parent community know. And so we, we try to get the information out that way. So we're, we're just mentioning this because I want to make sure you knew what, how the process worked and, um, you know, really to assure the community that when these things happen, we're really pretty close with, with law enforcement and trying to understand what, what's occurring and what, how we have to respond. So like I said, it didn't really happen to us, but I know that there were a lot of anxious people out there. Um, and I know Megan just happened to mention that we're, the RIS is working closely with, um, with the whole district and trying to understand how we're instituting safety procedures and systems. We've been doing a lot of work this year as a district with the AOE and with uh, our law enforcement par partners at looking at our entire system um, making sure that we are well aligned with the, she mentioned the, the name of the program, the I Love You Guys Foundation has a program that the state, <coughs> state supports. We've been doing that work to make sure that all our schools are doing the same thing. We have systems in place to take care of, uh, you know, be ready for any, any emergency. Um, so that work's been going on, and I just wanted to finally say, we encourage parents, we, we always say, see, say, see something, say something. The collaboration, the partnership that we have with parents and the community when, we, when they hear something happening is really important for us. So I got a, a few emails that day that this, that we're hearing about these swatting calls. Um, we heard, you know, teachers were talking, telling us about it. That was really helpful for us to be able to respond quickly. So please make sure if you hear something going on, or hear news that troubles you or some kind of a safety concern, please let us know. I just oh, sorry, have a question yeah. on that, Bill. Yeah. Um, as far as the um, state, I know they have somebody in for state security for schools. Yeah. And how much leeway does that leave for individual schools or districts to input their own say into the plan? Well, um, that that person that you you mentioned, uh, we actually asked him to come down last summer to kind of give us a give us a well, I don't know if the right word is an audit, but kind of take a look at what our how our systems work in a couple of our bigger schools and um, and see if there's changes that we can make. But every he gave us a, a good report and said mm -hmm. this is this is what you're doing well, this is what you you could change, this is what you should consider. Um, but he doesn't say you have to do this. You don't. Okay. You know. um, there is. Um, the legislation now, though, I think that's coming out that is saying that you're going to have to make sure you have certain procedures in place and certain systems in place. So there's, it's it's more regulated than has been in the past. My, that's kind of yeah. my concern, though, is I don't think it's a one size fits all. Right. You know, right. because we have so many different types of districts within the state that, True. and even within the city, the various schools are different in size and yep. and scope and things. So. Yeah, that's true. Um, <coughs> you know, it's, I, I don't think it's so strict that it one size doesn't, you know, the, the, the program doesn't affect the size of the school or, or how we respond. I think it, I think we can be flexible enough that we we can adhere to what they're recommending and um, and do it right for a small school in our district or our larger school. But um, so I, I, w I don't think that's so much of a challenge for us. The challenge really is it's a pretty comprehensive approach to think of all the different contingencies right. that you might have. Um, so it takes a lot of thought and a lot of a lot of effort for to think about the processes and then make sure people understand them, the staff especially, right. so in the kids too really. And and there are um, different, um, at least in other schools I've worked in, there there are like a, a series of different kinds of. You know, there's a lockdown, there's a hold, right. so there's yeah. a, you know, and, and for each one of those, there's a different, different protocol, right. what, what you're supposed to do in your classroom yeah. level and, and that sort of stuff. And, and it's the building principles usually that make the decision about which, you know, you might start off in a hold and then that changes over to a lockdown or something like that. So practicing those drills is really very oh, important. Yeah, That's really um, about that 
Okay, I'll move on to, uh, we had our last meeting with Portrait of the Graduate. I don't want to steal your thunder. I keep on taking, taking away your... It's okay. <laughs> it's really okay, Bill. <laughs> we had our last uh, meeting, our fourth meeting for Portrait of the Graduate last month. And we had our design team that represented the, uh, a pretty broad cross-section of the community, staff, mem staff members and students. And that work was completed. We are very appreciative to, for the people that came to those meetings, the four different meetings through, uh, through the course of four months. It allowed us to have a, a really good uh, vision of what we want our students to become that is based on community input. So that was, that was beneficial to us. Um, we, I'm going to mess up the word now that you said it. We, we made sure that we have our seven competencies all, <laughs> all set. Um, we did that work to make sure we, we are clear about what we are saying we want our students to become and how that was defined uh, in language. And then we started looking at um, where are we doing this already in instruction across the district, areas that we've, we're, we're already hitting those seven competencies, and then where might we look for other areas to add to our instruction to make sure we're hitting all seven of those. So that's, that was just a, a quick look for the, the larger group to kind of start to make that plan. We also talked about how we might be able to better communicate what we're shooting for the, the vision of our students uh, to the broader community. So we make sure that parents in the community understands this is what we want in our, our students at the end of 13 years with our CPS. So that work um, is complete. Now we're moving on to the strategic planning process. Um, so we've got the vision and now we're planning on how are we gonna get there. Um, and that work has been thought out with the, with the finance committee, with some, some contacts with an organization so we plan on continuing with this work through the spring, summer, and fall. Um, separately, I got a letter yesterday from Secretary of Education Dan French, and the letter was about Rutland Intermediate School. Did you get the letter? You did get the letter. Okay. I didn't. I didn't want you to think you were in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> she just left them. <laughs> Uh, the letter spoke about the great work that RIS is doing in implementing PBIS, Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports, and they were also recognized last October at a leadership conference uh, for that work, so that was, that was a nice letter to get. And last, I got another letter from Finance Director Carol Baker, and she sent me the list of students who were selected to participate at the Green Mountain, Mus Green Mountain Music District Festival that's coming up, and if you don't mind, if I can read these names so they get some mm -hmm. day in the sun. Uh, for high school band, Thomas Cotter, Caden Fredericks, Ivan Mokayev, Matthew Reveal, and Amelia Shelton. And for middle school chorus, Tristan Cameron, Molly Fairbrother Knight, Tinsley Borkowski, Rhea Barkley, Jaden Connolly, Cassandra Smith, Spencer Winchell, and Evan Ye Yelvington. And for high school orchestra, it's Mackenzie Barnes, Owen Dudley, Molly Hickey, Agatha Hopkins, Claire Hopkins, Amelia Sabatasso, Lane Shelton, Owen Spafford, and Finian Smathers. So congratulations to that large group of kids. Yeah. All right, so that's it for our superintendent's report. Next up is our recovery update. So we have Abby Bradowski and Mr. Bliss. Question? Good evening. I'm Abby Bradowski, the recovery coordinator for the district, and I'm here tonight to briefly discuss the district's process to continually monitor and adjust our ESSER spending to ensure that we spend as much of this gift as possible. Currently, the recovery and construction teams are focusing on spending the remaining ESSER II funds, which will likely provide professional development for all teachers and building leaders K through eight who will be implementing illustrative mathematics for the 23-24 school year. So far with ESSER II, which is over in September of 2023, the district has planned nearly $1.3 million in flooring projects, including asbestos removal in some locations, and will complete this round of flooring projects by September. ESSER II funds 13 positions in the district targeted on student well-being, curricular and academic recovery, and ESSER grant coordination. 
ARP ESSER, which you'll remember is the third round, will continue several of these initiatives, including personnel and professional development. As a reminder to the board and the community, the entire ARP ESSER plan is available on the district webpage. So you click the central office tab and you can go down to the section called ESSER information. And we talked and reviewed um, the plan at the board on December 13th, 2023. So in our ongoing effort to maximize the grant funds in support of our students, families, and community of supportive taxpayers, we are constantly assessing the flow of funds with an eye on the end of their term of application. We remain ready to pivot if necessary and are exploring continuation of several other projects, including strategic planning for the next 10 years, additional asbestos removal, outdoor learning spaces, and upgrades to security and IT systems district-wide. The recovery and construction teams continuously monitor these federal funds and want to make sure that the board is aware of these efforts. The end goal is to save our local taxpayers money and maintain a high degree of fiscal responsibility as we work through the ESSER funds between now and September 2024. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. All right, so next up is our committee reports, and first on that is the policy committee. Turn it over to Kathy. Okay, um, we uh, addressed two policies at the last policy committee meeting. Uh, the first related to evaluation of the super superintendent, um, Mr. Olson, and um, you'll see that there's uh, an additional paragraph at the end of the policy that relates to the confidentiality. Of the event of the evaluation um, the second policy uh, 7699 uh, had to do with parent and family engagement with school and what we were given basically was a, a model policy from the state and that's what we're pr proposing that we adopt um, I do have um, the previous policy was was uh, was different the intentions are the same but it was different um, but the appropriate thing, I think, is to adopt what the state is asking us to. So they're both here for first reading. And um, if you have any questions, please join us at the next policy committee, and we can discuss it more. So I, I would entertain a motion for the first reading of policy 4250 and 7699. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. I have one piece of input from Mr. Fagan, who couldn't be here, just in terms of discussing that motion. On uh, page three, section seven, the fifth, sixth, seventh bullet down, he suggested moving our family to the end and just changing that sentence a little bit. It's just a little syntax adjustment. It won't change a thing, but I wanted to make sure Mr. Fagan was heard, even though he couldn't be here tonight. And we'll look at that. When it comes back for a second reading, it will be adjusted appropriately. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 opposed? Okay. Motion carries. That's it for policy, right? Yes. That's okay. It for policy. Excellent. So next up is the building committee report. And we have Kevin. Okay. The building committee met on February 7th, a week ago. Uh, we talked about a lot of the things that Abby just mentioned. Um, spending that ESSER money on lots of different things that we need to have uh, fixed up around around the school district um, there's a um, there's a, a bunch there were a bunch of uh, HVAC which is heating ventilation and air conditioning um, things that needed to be done and 12 of them were put out to bid and only we, we only got bids for four of them so we're gonna have to uh, resubmit um, for bids to get the other eight done but um, we approved earlier tonight doing those four um, there's also, uh, we're looking at getting outdoor pavilions <coughs> built for <coughs> outdoor classrooms, which apparently there's a lot of, um, a lot of interest in, uh, submitting bids for those programs. So that, that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, there's also, um, flooring that has been done here at Longfellow, some of it, which still needs to be done. It, it's not completed yet, is it? Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Um, there's also pipe insulation projects at the middle school. Um, the big one um, is we're going to be replacing um, the flooring in the auditorium at RIS. And 
In order to do that, all the seats have to be pulled up, and we're looking at replacing the seating. Correct. And yes. and then and there's some discussion about what to do with the older seating. There may be you know interest in people buying like sections of seating or whatever. <laughs> so look for that in the future. That's that's coming. All those that don't have enough clutter in your homes, like me, <laughs> um, <laughs> you might want to buy you know. A, you know, for that home theater you've got? Um, you know. Don't tell my husband. Okay. No? Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, um, also, we, we discussed a stormwater project that's been sort of ongoing, uh, ways to make sure that the, the runoff from stormwater around, this is specific, uh, this is at different places around the district. Um, You don't want to go into more detail about that, do you? No, we've <laughs> talked about this before. Okay. Um, and then there's a bunch of work that, that we're going to be doing uh, February break. I say we because I'm not doing any of it. But <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's projects out there that Glenn will be very busy with. Yes. Glenn and the guys. And, well, there are women involved, too, I'm sure. Um, there, there's the thing I want to correct, though. Um, on our... Um, on our agenda tonight, it says the next meeting of the policy committee will be March 7th. Yes. Since March 7th is town meeting day, we will not be meeting on that night. We're going to actually not have a uh, building and grounds meeting that night. It will be, then our next meeting will be um, April 4th. Okay. And that's all I have. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. All right, so um, next up is finance and strategic planning. So, Meredith. Thanks, Allison. Uh, we also met, finance and uh, planning committee met last Tuesday on the 7th of February, and we had three main topics that we talked about. Uh, the first one was the annual budget communication plans, of which there are many. Um, I don't think I ever realized how much went into communicating the awesomeness of our budget. So um, and there's really three main facets of that plan and one is uh, social media uh, and so there's been a significant effort by um, our IT folks and Facebook people to really push push some really positive messages uh, describing the educational experiences that our students and teachers have together um, making sure that people know that there's a story behind our numbers and all the things all the great things that we do so we we like to encourage everyone to do all that you can to like and share. If you're on Facebook, like and share, like and share, like and share, and get it out there and really uh, promote all the awesome things that, that our, um, our schools are doing. Uh, part two of the annual budget communication plans is really the engagement of our civic, uh, uh, engagement of civic leaders. And so last month, uh, Bill and Ted, <laughs> Sorry. Every time, every time, <laughs> Bill and Ted. Excellent adventure. <laughs> yeah. And there, especially. <laughs> Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. Um, as part of that, they attended a meeting of the City Board of Aldermen and Women to update them on the budget uh, with those civic leaders. So uh, there's additional meetings planned with the Rotary Club. I know, Charlene, you were helping with that, I think, and, and other organizations. Um, the Finance and Planning Committee did suggest that we develop uh, that. We asked Ted and his the amazing folks here to develop a list of like five or six key points that we could really, the board and other people could use if people asked us questions about the upcoming budget vote. And I know that's in pretty solid draft form and should be completed by the end of this week um, to be shared with everybody. So thanks for that, uh, Ted and everybody working on that. And then we, uh, so again, annual budget communication plans, three facets, social media, civic leaders. The third facet is other community outreach. And so we are, uh, we discussed maybe trying to highlight a recent portrait of a graduate work as uh, another way to be like, hey, this is how great we are. Not sure that's gonna all mix together because there's just a lot of information out there. We might wait to really talk more about portrait of a graduate. Um, and so then there's this other regular outreach that have been done in the past in terms of the uh, signs on school buses uh, and uh, Ted will conduct the annual crazily attended um, voter information session I'm being facetious uh, 
the night before town hall meeting day, if anybody wants to learn more about the budget, uh, please come join Ted. I think it is here. Yeah, it's at Longfellow and via Zoom. So more on that. Uh, if you want to, what time is that? 6.30 p.m. here at Longfellow. Okay. All right, and that's it on um, the annual budget communication plans. And the posters. The posters. Oh, the and posters. The nice yeah. spread oh that was gosh. in the paper. Uh, the poster, if you're here in the room with us, you can see that there is an amazing poster um, with lots of uh, tremendous information about our budget and how it's broken down and, and what it means to the school uh, to have the budget passed, of course, and, and what we do with that money. So they're in all the schools and also around the community, correct? Yeah, okay, yep, yep, thank you. Uh, thanks for that, I forgot about that amazing, yeah, great, thanks. I can see it from here. Yeah, great. That's easy to remind us. So topic two is, Bill alluded to, the next plan, um, excuse me, the next steps in our strategic planning process. Um, I do want to also, on behalf of the board, thank the amazing community support that we had for the Portrait of a Graduate process. It was incredible. I mean, really, I don't know if I've seen anything quite like it. The amount of stakeholders and engaged people um, from, from around our community that were part of that process. It was uh, really quite inclusive and encompassing. So no one can say that they weren't represented. Uh, I really feel strongly about that. So. Uh, uh, so our steps m moving forward, we, we talked about maybe three options uh, to choose one, one of three options as we move forward with our strategic planning portion of this. One was to re-engage Patel for Kids, one was to engage a different consultant or facilitator, and one was to do it in-house. Uh, we overwhelmingly were very excited to <coughs> say that we would love to see Patel for Kids stay with us, especially if we can have Beth Sil Silveri, Silveri on, on board to help us as well. So I think. We are um, um, moving along with that approval, right? Okay, we are moving along with that approval. Um, and it looks like it'll be about $46,000 for on-site, for the on-site meetings format versus a virtual format, which would only have saved us like $5,000, which certainly wouldn't be, be worth doing is what we felt. So uh, yeah, so uh, look for more on that, I think we'll, look to really tackle that in the fall. Is that correct, Bill? Maybe we'd... Yeah, uh, <coughs> that, that's our intention. ESSER funded. Oh, yes, thank you, ESSER funded, yeah. yeah. Um, we've also talked with her, and we have a meeting, I, th I hope for it's gonna be next week, but if it's not next week, it's gonna be in the beginning of March with talking about looking at a equi equity audit as well. So like, trying to do that in the spring into the Great. summer and then go into the fall with the um, strategic planning process. Great. So we have all that information together. Great. All right, good. Yeah, the equity audit is exciting. I know that's been something we've been looking to do for a while, so good. Okay. Um, I think that's all on strategic plan next steps. And so our next meeting, uh, similar to what Kevin said, we are also not meeting on March 7th because it's uh, town meeting day. And uh, we feel like whatever we have can wait till the April 4th meeting. And so April 4th will be our next meeting. Thank you very much. Thanks. And then superintendent evaluation, that snuck on there again. We do not do <laughs> that because we haven't. Sorry, I no. should have looked at it and been like, uh, <laughs> Yeah, okay, I didn't yeah. notice either until okay. like sitting here today. Yep, okay. Like, no. <laughs> Sorry. That hasn't met, so that doesn't need to report out. So uh, next on our agenda would be any unfinished business to come before the board. Seeing none. Any new business to come before the board? Okay. Um, so then I would entertain a motion for a five-minute recess for the board. Approved. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you.